So as I um, said, uh, welcome everyone online and in the room. Um, my name is Harriet O'Neill and I'm Assistant Director for the Fine Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences at the British School at Rome. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our Boston Fellow, Rachel Howarth, tonight, and she's standing behind me. As many as you know, Rachel is a researcher of Italian popular music and culture of the 20th century. She has published books and articles on Italian singer-songwriters of the 1960s, celebrity scandals, and Italian variety television. Her most recent work focused on the significance of the popular music star Mina, and this research is the focus of the forthcoming monograph entitled The Many Meanings of Mina, Popular Music, Stardom in Post-War Italy, which we've been published by Intellect um, either at the end of this year or the beginning of 2022. It's been a pleasure to have Rachel with us um, uh, for the last two months, and I'd highly recommend following her photos of the day on Twitter, where you can also read about the development of this paper. And actually, I find that really fascinating to think about her thinking, as well as hearing about it um, at breakfast and over lunch. So before handing over to Rachel, I'd just like to mention that this event is being recorded. And those online, um, please type your questions in um, using the Q&A function as they occur to you or at the end. Um, and that reminds me to say thank you once again for coming and hand over to Rachel for Stasera in TV, Italian variety television and its stars, 1954 to 1974. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Harriet. The balancing of the tech and everything is always a little bit awkward now because we're now going, which button do we press to make sure that things are hidden but that you can still see things? That's the one. Yes. That's the one. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much everybody for being here and I'm particularly grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today about this research project then, which is the research I've been conducting here in Rome for the last two months. It's a real privilege to be here and I am extremely grateful to the BSR for supporting my research project, which as you can see looks at Italian variety television and its stars and that's during the, 20, the first 20 years of Italian TV, which is when the medium was under the control of the state. And my broad aim with the project is to explore the conceptualization and significance of some of Italy's best loved TV variety stars from this 20 year period. Now, I know some people then when I kind of say I'm looking at Italian variety TV and stars sort of have some questions in mind. So I'm going to start by addressing some of those potential questions. And, and those of you then who have kind of been privy to some of this research at breakfast and dinner conversations um, will possibly have heard me talk about this in a little bit of detail. So I'm gonna address the first question, which is why maybe am I looking at stars anyway? Well, my argument for the project is that stars can reveal much about the society and culture from which they originate. And this is actually what Stephen Gundel has argued about for the Italian context, when he suggests that Italy's stars offer this significant way of reading Italian society and culture. And that, as you can see, is because he says they function as this kind of cultural symbol and conduit for ideas about gender and values and national identity. But I would also add to that list and say that I think they also reveal things about accepted ways of behaving, dominant ideologies, and the social and cultural status quo. So stars embody a specific set of meanings and connotations that reveal something about the systems of cultural value and the wider established ideologies and ways of behaving that are at work in Italian society. Um, I will add Stephen's, Stephen Gundel's argument is actually about cinema stars specifically, but I want to apply it to stars of other media and obviously in this case, television stars. The thing is possibly the next question you may well have is, well, okay, but why TV? Well, I'm building, hopefully building anyway, on a growing body of work that's coming um, through in Italian studies that looks at television specifically. And that reveals then how institutions, markets, and press discourses work together to offer a particular view of Italian culture or of brand Italy. So in other words, through a focus on textual analysis, circulation, consumption, and reception, television starts to shed light on the intricacies of and debates around Italian identity. 
And really that's my aim with this project, to explore the values and ideals that made up the conceptualization of national identity in this kind of golden age of Italian TV, which is the late 50s through to the kind of mid 70s. Now this is a golden age, um, really, um, kind of scholars have kind of labelled it as such. But, but I think probably what's more important for the project is that it's, it's the, the period when Radio Televisione Italiana, or RAI, was the only broadcaster. Because of that, it was subject to top-down political control by the Christian Democrat governments of the time, and also from the Vatican. And this kind of political interventionism focused on the moral and pedagogical duties of the broadcaster in this period. And that included informing, educating, and entertaining the audience, a motto that you might have heard somewhere else, because that's the BBC's motto, which the Italian kind of state broadcaster drew on. Now, as a result of this, the programmes that were produced and broadcast featured content that was in line with strict political, ideological, religious, and gender ideals, as approved by the government. And these ideals then were being broadcast to larger and larger audiences through this 20 year period. Television viewing, I'm not going to, I can't argue that it's a mass phenomenon, but it's getting more and more popular in the period. So we go from something like 366,000 subscriptions in the mid 1950s to over 5 million by the mid 1960s to over 12 million by the mid 1970s. So, so more and more people have got access to TV in this period. So in a way we can start to see television as an ideal value, um, vehicle for transmitting ideals and values to a larger proportion of the Italian population. One particularly useful tool in this transmission of ideals and values was the variety show. And this is what Franco Monteleone, a, a historian of, of Italian TV and radio, has argued. The format becomes a means by which Rai could achieve what Monteleone calls its homogenizing mission. So this involved firstly establishing a regular viewing public for TV and then showcasing a series of ideals and values in programmes that would be consumed and internalised by the audience so as to create a community of Italian viewers who would have this shared set of, I've already said, political, ideological, religious and gender ideals that were government approved. Now Monteleone, as you can kind of see in the quotation, he doesn't actually talk about how variety shows homogenise the viewing public. But I'm going to suggest that an important element of that process is actually Rai's use of particular presenters and acts and stars, ultimately. These represent, transmit and encourage the acceptance and internalisation by the audience of a specific set of values. Now those might be cultural, they might be political, they might be broadly ideological, for example. But those then function to inform, educate, entertain and thereby homogenise, is my argument, the viewing public. So that's broadly kind of what I'm doing. I have promised that there will be some variety show clips in here, so let's get to the variety shows and the stars in more detail. So this evening, I want to focus specifically on the 1950s, which is a little bit off the brief that I offered everybody. Um, but the reason for this is for the past eight weeks, I have been spending my time in the lovingly called Discoteca di Stato, that is actually what it's called as well, the State Discotheque, um, watching as many programmes as I can get my hands on, and that's turned out to be a lot of the rare programmes from the 1950s. So that's what I've concentrated on, and that's what I want to share with you then this evening. Um, I want to also explain probably what is varietà, that's probably a good place to start, what well, actually is a varietà. Um, and I'm going to start using the Italian term now as well because I think there is something specifically Italian about this genre, which I'm, I'm going to try and then explain this evening. So to give you a definition, I'm going to quote uh, a scholar called Pontemoli, who has been working on kind of the representation of jazz in television. But he explains that, quote, the Saturday Night Varieta is, in both structure and form, a synthesis of existing performance traditions, including the Review, the Curtain Raiser, the Café Chantant, and the Cabaret. When combined with televisual approaches from abroad, such as that of the big show with guest stars, it gives rise in Italy to what we would refer to today as a format, a programme with a recognisable structure, which is adaptable and open to gradual adjustments, but which has precise linguistic elements and a relatively stable setup. 
And he then gives three examples of what makes this relatively stable setup, three kind of characteristics, three particular areas of strength and appeal. Number one, we get comedy sketches. So I've been doing quite a bit of laughing over the last eight weeks, which has been nice. We get musical performances, specifically jazz and popular music performances. I'm not singing tonight, but because I have, I'm in a little booth in the discoteca, it does mean that you can hum along because nobody else is listening. And the other thing then that you get is carefully choreographed dance routines, and I won't be doing that tonight either. So that's the kind of program that I'm talking about and the kind of content that I've been watching and the kinds of things that I'm going to share with you this evening. And particularly then I want to talk about five shows that I've been watching and use them to illustrate this kind of the informative, the educative, the entertainment functions of television in this period and then shed light on how even in the 1950s but I was creating programming that functioned to first create and then educate this community of television viewers. So these are my five questions, my five programs in no particular order, I will admit. I've kind of listed them chronologically, but I'm going to deal with them kind of in a slightly different way. Um, so Un Due Tres is the first series, which um, lasted five years. This was a sketch parody comedy show that then also featured guest performances by musical stars. The hosts were Ugo Tognazzi and Raimondo Vianello, for those of you who may recognize names. Both were well-established comedy actors in theater and cinema. And unfortunately, only the 1959 series has survived, hence it's in bold on the screen. So that's the series I'm gonna talk about. Next up is La Regina ed Io. Um, so this is, I guess it's a prototype talk show, almost. Um, and it features the singer Nila Pizzi and the comedian Franca Valeri. Um, and the kind of setup of the show is that you have Pizzi singing kind of some of her well-known songs interspersed with monologues from Valeri. And, and those of you then that know kind of Valeri's performances into the 60s and 70s, it's actually in this program that she starts to establish her, her kind of well-loved characters who will come back time and time again through her repertoire. Um, there are then interviews with special invited guests too. This one is particularly striking because given that women on Italian TV in this period were in the minority, the fact the programme is actually showcasing the work of two female hosts is actually really important, I think. Third up then is Canzonissima. Now, I, some of you may have already heard about Canzonissima, so this is a song competition. Um, which was linked to the National Lottery. It had actually launched in 1956 under a different name, but it would go on to feature annually on Italian TV all the way through to 1975 every year. So the 58 series that I'm going to talk about tonight is hosted by presenter Renato Tagliani, and he was already well known to television viewers from having hosted game shows kind of in the previous year, so he was a familiar face. And the way the show works then is that viewers would vote for their favourite Italian song. The catch was that you had to go and buy a lottery ticket to get your postcard to be able to vote. So that's how then it kind of funded the National Lottery. And then when the votes were in, each week the guest singers would perform the votes that the, the songs that had received the most votes. You also get the lottery winners announced each week as well in that programme. Music is the focus of Buone Vacanze. Um, that's kind of I'm going to go with musical extravaganza, which probably makes it sound a lot more exciting than it actually is. But it was hosted by uh, Gorni Kramer, who is a, a kind of conductor-composer. And each week it features then a range of musical items from regular guest singers, invited singers. And then you also have the showcasing of a conductor or a composer each week too. So a slightly different take on music. And then the last series is Il Teatrino di Valtacchiari. So this is hosted by the eponymous Valtacchiari and is a kind of review show that highlights Chiari's talents and established star status as a comedy actor of stage and screen. So you get sketches that highlight him um, kind of in, in full comedic flow and then you get performances as well from guest singers. So let's have a look at some of these in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to start at the end of my list with Walter Chiari. Now I've already mentioned that one of the primary functions of television and by extension varietà in this early period is to establish a regular viewing public. Okay, 
And the ways in which Varieta addresses the viewing public actually start to shed light on how these programmes contributed to building a national community of viewers who then consume the shows. So the example then is what Walter Chiari does on this programme. As the host, he's responsible for addressing the viewer and therefore has this important role to play in creating a sense of a kind of shared viewing consumption experience for his public. Just to point out, by 1959, Chiari is already a, a kind of well-known, well-established, well-loved kind of face of Italian stage and screen. Um, definitely associated with comedic roles, but he's also been successful on television. Um, viewers would have recognised him as the host of La Via del Successo, which is another varietà from 1958, which I haven't got to yet, which is why it's not here at the minute. Um, but he's also a guest performer on the 58 series of Canzonissima, which I have seen, and he does kind of a similar kind of comedy routine there as well. So he kind of has a, a very kind of well-known style of performance. Um, and the little article that's there on the, the left is from Radio Corriere, so kind of the Radio Times equivalent, um, and they are kind of billing this series um, as, well really as, as Walter Chiari's series, he is for them the absolute standout performer, he's the star attraction of the show for the viewers, so this is why they're going to be watching. In the first episode then, Chiari opens the program with a direct address to the viewers, which I attempted to transcribe, but I will translate as I go through it. Um, so he stands on the theatre stage, so the kind of the studio is a theatre stage, um, so you can kind of sometimes see the public in the background and you can see um, kind of the set, kind of in the wings, all set up kind of in, on the camera. Um, but he's front and centre at the theatre stage and he addresses, as I'm going to do now, the, the viewers in, in the audience and with him and the viewers at home. And he does this kind of spotting where he talks to different people. As he addresses them, then he uses a direct and mostly informal tone and form of address. And he, he explains basically what viewers can expect from the series. So this is going to be a varieta that will draw on his experience of theatre, he explains. And then he outlines this thought process behind the show's format. So this is what he says. He says, there was something at the back of my mind which pushed me to make this show pretty clean, intelligent, but also a simple show. My concern was that everyone should be able to understand and follow what's going on. Let me give you some pretty dry figures. I do review shows every year and theatre shows are a regular practice. They're more commercial, they're more popular than ever before. But let's face it, you don't go for cultural reasons. You don't go because it's good etiquette. And you certainly don't go because you want to learn something. No, you go because you want to avoid being bored. <laughs> or you want to relax for an hour. It's that that counts, he says. That's my bad translation there for you. So the aim of the show, he concludes, which I haven't put on the screen, is to offer something very simple, he says, with clean comedy, hopefully that's not vulgar, that above all is enjoyable and relaxing. Now in the address, as you can probably pick up from that, he addresses everybody as voy, this group that he knows, you, my friends, the community. He's suggesting then that the audience that's watching the show is doing so for the same reasons, yeah? None of them want to be bored, they all want to relax. And they're all going to be able to enjoy the show in the same way and for the same reasons. After all, it's Chiari's approach to creating the show's clean, simple content from which then all viewers will derive their enjoyment. And this suggests a shared viewing experience and therefore then beyond that, a community of viewers that's starting to emerge. Now Chiari's already established status as a theatre actor then brings a level of authority to what he's saying and to the creation of this community who will enjoy the show in the same way. He's bringing his well-known talents for comedy to the show, so audiences already know what to expect and they already know how they might enjoy what they're going to watch. I think here Chiari is acting as a kind of authority figure in the context of varietà, but also of television more broadly, reassuring audiences of the quality of what they're going to see on this relatively new medium, and then also authorising their communal response to the programme, well, suggesting and then authorising a communal response. 
Another strategy then that is very striking in terms of um, creating a national community of viewers is the showcasing that we get on Italian TV of ordinary life and ordinary people from across the country. Now this approach informed the production of the popular quiz shows of the period which were La Shora Doppia and Il Musichiere, which I'm not focusing on because technically they're quiz shows and not varietà, but they are quite fun, so I may look at them anyway, but anyway. But this kind of inclusion of ordinary people also influenced the format of Canzonissima. Now, I've already said this was a song competition. It was constructed around famous popular singers of the period who would perform then this range of kind of songs. But the viewers were involved because they voted for their favourite songs, so they were shaping the content of the programme. Furthermore, ordinary viewers who'd been lucky enough to win the lottery were then featured each week on the programme. So to present these lottery winners, the host, Tagliani, reads out surname, first name, address, street name and house number, and town and province for each winner. I mean, you certainly couldn't do that today with GDPR, but yeah, he reads it all out. Everybody knows where they win, where, you know, where the winners live. The other thing then is as he's reading this, we as the viewers see some kind of candid camera sort of footage um, of the winners going about their daily lives. They're at a bar, they're shopping at a market, they're walking down the street together, they're working in a field. Um, often the winners have their backs to the camera, so you, it's quite difficult to distinguish who they are. So the footage gets paused as Tagliani reads their name and, and superimposed on screen is this great big white arrow kind of, you know, they go, this is the person here. One of the one million lire winners, who we get told is Signor Zuliani, gets special treatment because he gets the film crew to actually visit his house. They film him with his wife and his baby sat in the lounge and they pass him the kind of the winning check, you know. So you get this kind of focus on ordinary people doing kind of extraordinary things, now winning the lottery, I know, but extraordinary in that sense. The other thing is you get the winners reported on in newspapers and magazines, and that's what you've got on screen here. So on the left, you've got some of the stories then that were um, um, reporting kind of the details of the winners, the, the, the kind of the middle box there gives the, the details of La Signorina Maria Infante who won, um, and where did she live? Is that Padova? So it gives you exactly the details again reproduced in the newspapers. You then also have articles that speculate about how accurate the announcement of who won actually was. So the, the one here um, on the right is, is the, the, the speculation that perhaps the butcher from Ancona actually didn't win after all because he says he missed work because he didn't feel well, not because he'd gone away with 500,000 euros, um, a lira or whatever. So you get this kind of focus on ordinary people um, across the media actually, not just kind of in television, but television backed up then with newspapers. Now, in her book on television stardom in Italy, Giulia Mugeo talks about this tendency of TV in the 1950s to turn everyday Italians into television personalities. She explains that from the second half of the 50s, the unknown faces that are found by television are inserted into a network of filming and program launches and are at the center of discussion and analysis, not only from cinema, but also from illustrated news magazines and newspapers of the period, like we've just seen. And she also then sort of suggests this, that the television non-professional exists, if only fleetingly, thanks to reproduction, the duplication of their own image, and that then is multiplied and disseminated across other cultural industries of the period. Now, Canzonissima for me certainly fits this trend and showcases ordinary Italians as stars of the programme alongside the guest singers. The way that each lottery winner is presented in the same way, well, at least the winners of under a million lire, they all get presented in the same way. That emphasizes this idea of duplication and multiplication that Mujay is talking about. In a way, the creation of the lottery winners as new TV stars had a built-in expiry date where new winners would replace old ones, but essentially the kind of ordinary Italian star would remain the same thanks to this kind of similar approach to filming and editing the segment. And even a kind of similar look on the part of the ordinary star who gets filmed at such a distance that as the viewer you can't kind of pick out any distinguishing features to be able to start to kind of identify them. 
So the cloud of ordinary Italian stars is actually very ordinary, to the point that any viewer could become one of these new television heroes by winning the lottery, obviously. Significantly, there is representation across the country. We've got winners coming from both the north and the south of Italy. And as a result, TV viewers were able to see villages and towns from across the country, as well as the geographical differences between the various locations. But the everyday activities that these ordinary Italian stars slash lottery winners um, are doing is actually the same. Everybody's going to the market, everybody's going to the bar, everybody's, you know, you get the same kind of footage repeated. That suggests that daily life is the same for all Italians across the country. And consequently, that there is a national community of, of Italians to which these ordinary stars belong, as well as then the television viewers. So these segments for me function to educate the viewing public about the rest of the country, promoting a sense of national unity, as well as obviously then encouraging people to buy a lottery ticket. Now, another aspect of Cansonissima that promotes a sense of national unity is the inclusion of the nation's favourite songs. And in fact, popular music becomes a useful tool for television in the creation of a national community of viewers, as the songs and singers featured on TV arguably represented national preferences and collective tastes. And this is particularly evident in Buone Vacanze, which showcases the talents of successful singers who perform songs that are well known and popular with audiences. I'm just going to play you the opening credits um, for the episode that aired in August, August the 8th, 1959. I'm going to hope that the sound is okay also for those on Zoom. <laughs> e stornelli d'amor romanze persine motivi del tempo che fu e brani dal musichier una sfilata di novità musiche del giubbò cantar così auguri a tutti noi buone vacanze a tutti voi He goes on to sing another number straight after that so I just caught the pause there which is pretty good pause now, the credits that you just watched, in general, every episode feature the singers and musicians who are going to be on that show that evening. So the lineup changes every week. But I've identified and written up for you, this is the lineup that we've just seen. And actually, it's a representative lineup of the type of music that features on the programme. For the most part, as you can kind of see from a quick skim, um, the singers belong to what we can call musica leggera, popular music in general but are then mostly associated with this canzone all'italiana. Now, this is a particular genre that emerges in Italy during the 20th century and is often most clearly associated with the songs of the San Remo Festival. And scholar Agostini explains that for the 1950s, at least, we've got two types of song that were most prevalent at the festival. First, quote, melodramatic songs or slow songs, mainly in lyric form, derived from 19th century Italian opera with or without an introductory verse. And then two, quote, cheerful and carefree songs with a bright and positive feel, sometimes witty and playful and sometimes satirical. In these songs, the voice had a more natural tone, end quote. I think by that he means not operatic, okay? Now, those are actually the characteristics also of the canzoni all'italiana that appear on Buone Vacanze and are performed by the featured singers. Now, the inclusion of these canzoni on television was part of a wider codification of the canzone all'italiana as such that was present then also on radio and in cinema, as well as in the popular press through reviews and interviews with singers. 
This codification process not only ensured the diffusion of this type of song, but, Tomatis has argued, also provided the constitutive discourse that would identify, establish, and then perpetuate the rules of the genre, so what the songs would actually sound like. Including Canzonia Italiana on television contributed to broadcasting these genre expectations to a national audience and functioned to reaffirm the popularity of the genre and its stars for television viewers, who now obviously have the added benefit of being able to see their favourite singers actually performing. There are two notable exceptions to the singers of the canzone all'italiana genre who appear on Buone Vacanze in the 1959 series that I just want to briefly mention. These two exceptions were the Italian urlo singers, Mina and Adriano Celentano. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with urlo, it can be seen as a translation into Italian culture of American rock and roll. But it, the, the kind of translation didn't water down or domesticate the original, but rather was informed by a specifically Italian context and its different musical, ethnic, political, linguistic and religious experiences. I'm quoting Stephen Gundel's work on uh, Adriano Celentano there. Now, Urlo then was also very much perceived as being in opposition to that traditional national song form of Canzone all'Italiana that I've just talked about. Canzone Italiana, according to Tomatis' analysis at least, that was Italian. Urlo was foreign. American, really, but foreign. Uh, Canzone Italiana was long standing. Urlo was modern. Canzone Italiana was melodic. Urlo was rhythmic. Now, all of these things were kind of bad as well. Urlo was kind of new, it was different. And its arrival in Italy actually generated a wave of moral panic for the Italian adult audience. As a result, Urlo didn't tend to feature on Italian television screens generally, despite the growing popularity of the genre from kind of about mid-1956, actually. Indeed, for the majority of the episodes of Buone Vacanze, we get singers invited to perform kind of modern jukebox songs, which you would imagine would be Urlo, but instead they're the very traditional singers who sing very traditional canzoni all'italiana in that slot. So including Mina and Celentano on the program is actually an important development in the showcasing on TV of Italian popular music to a national audience. Providing a space for Urlo demonstrates that by 1959, this kind of new foreign modern music is here to stay in Italy. Perhaps TV then could provide a safe space within which this music could be performed and consumed. In the case of Celentano, which I'm gonna show you, this safe space is created by allowing the singer to perform with the studio orchestra and he's even allowed to conduct them. Well, he attempts to conduct them anyway. But this means he has a specific safe space in the studio in which to perform and also a recognisable role on the programme as well that he's required to perform. So it kind of renders him a bit safer. Um, this is my musical interlude now whilst I grab a drink and you can enjoy some Celentano. Oh, 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 oh,
my suspicion is at that point, that's when the conducting should have happened and it just kind of didn't. But there you go. Okay. So musical interlude aside then. So far, I've kind of been exploring how varieta in this period functioned to create this kind of national community of viewers by using established stars from theater, in the case of Walter Chiari, to act as an authority figure to address viewers as a group and authorize them their reactions to and enjoyment of programs they were watching. And then we've got kind of the use of established stars from radio and popular music who confirmed ideals of national musical tastes as another way of kind of pointing to a national audience through that kind of established popularity of canzone all'italiana. The last two examples I want to share with you show um, use established stars then to educate viewers in very specific ways. And this is the case with La Regina ed io, which is my first example in this category. So in this show, the established stars I already mentioned are Nila Pizzi, there she is. Now she is the proclaimed Regina della Canzone, the queen of pop in this period, but she is really the embodiment of this kind of nationally popular canzone all'italiana because she is the winner of the 1951 and the 1952 Sanremo festival. So she really is kind of established as, as that kind of figurehead. In the guise then of Pizzi's secretary, we have Franca Valeri, who was well known to audiences from her appearances on radio and theater and cinema, but also from a 1951 book that she'd published that was called Il Diario della Signorina Snob, so the Diary of Miss Snob, uh, which was a collection of kind of humorous observations about Italian daily life as a woman in the 1950s. Significantly, it's the female community of viewers that La Regina Edio targets, as this clip from the first episode illustrates. Ah, che cara persona. Lo inviteremo qualche volta quando verrà a Roma per qualche congresso. Milla? Mm? Senti, hai visto che bella moda c'è quest'anno? Ma sarà. Io non capisco com'è fatta. Ma cara, è così semplice. Non è mai stata così semplice. Non c'è nessun problema di colori, perché si usano, guarda, colori classici, direi. Il cognaco palina, il bianco pioggia, poi tutti i blu della gamma atlantica, quindi c'è una scelta enorme, vero? Poi c'è il rosso sangue di pollo, il grigio paura, quindi come colori non c'è problema. Non so, se ti vuoi fare un cappotto, io ho studiato bene la situazione, il segreto è semplicissimo. Il cappotto quest'anno parte dalla spalla, non, non, non c'è altra soluzione, capisci? Per esempio, no, la cosa un pochino più complicata, semmai è l'abitino da giorno, perché c'è l'abolizione completa delle pants, soltanto la principale che è approfondita. Basta. Come tessuti classici, vero? Perché abbiamo la lana cristallizzata, abbiamo il cotone giavanese e la seta porcellanizzata, quindi quelli si trovano dappertutto, non so, dico... Non c'è problema, trovo. Del resto te lo diranno anche loro perché le ho invitate apposta. Chi? Due importantissimi esponenti della moda italiana. Ti toglieranno qualsiasi dubbio se ne hai ancora. Signore, buongiorno. Come va, carissima? Come va? Accomodatevi. Milla, ti presento la signora Curie, la signorina Molto piacere. La signora Curie è venuta apposta per noi da Milano. Ok. I'll stop there. The subtitling got an awful lot harder to put in when four people started talking, so I, I, I'll, I'll stop it there. Now, the rest of the segment actually features Valeri interviewing the two. Dressmakers seems like such the wrong word, given how glamorous they are, but the two dressmakers who are here then, the representatives of Italian fashion, and Valeri then asks them questions about the design process, about the season's fashions, and about how easy it is to balance client demands. Now, I think really the segment here is working to educate female viewers in a number of ways, and I'll, I'll just try and explain how that is. I think the set itself is really interesting. It's a modern house. It's beautifully decorated and equipped. It's a domestic space which female viewers could aspire to. The, the programme actually opens with the pair, with Nila Pizzi and, and Franca Valeri in the kitchen cooking, and you see kind of wonderful kind of modern domestic appliances in that space as well. Now, showing such spaces on television showcased what Stephen Gundel characterizes as the, quote, the glamour, the tempting appeal of new goods, more than the actual goods themselves, which offered workers and their families a, new, a whole new range of aspirations and desires, end quote. 
I think the discussion about fashion trends functions in the same way here. It offers insight into the glamorous world of female fashion and thereby educates female viewers in aspirations that they may well want to, to kind of develop around how they should dress. But the initial discussion between Pizzi and Valeri is actually also pretty funny. My subtitling does not do it justice. Viewers are actually encouraged to laugh at the idea of Valeri, the secretary, teaching fashion trends to Pizzi, who is the established queen of pop and very, very well dressed, always elegant whenever she appears on stage or on, on the small screen. You may not have picked up on it, but Valeri then describes the materials and colours that are out there in a very exaggerated and kind of made up fashion. Quite why one would want a dress of red like chicken's blood, I mean, I don't know, but the point is, yeah, Valeri is poking fun here at the kind of broader aspirations around fashion trends and, and social mobility in a way. Her irony here encourages viewers to laugh at the ideas of good taste, culture and high society that are behind her comments about fashion trends. But then I think viewers also are encouraged to reflect on their own aspirations that are then getting reflected back to them on screen. So there's something self-critical, I think, there going on, or at least the encouragement for viewers to be a little bit more self-critical. I'm all right, I think, for time, because I have one last example to share with you, which is uh, the series Un, Do, Tre, then, which again um, features then education of viewers as an important characteristic. So this is the series that ran from 54 to 59 and was fronted by Ugo Tognazzi and Raimondo Vianello, as I mentioned. I think I said those, those they, they were both established actors, comedy actors from theatre and cinema. And that established star status again brings this kind of idea of authority to the series and that helps audiences to understand the quality that they can expect from the programme. This is particularly the case with Tognazzi, who was arguably more well known to audiences than his partner in the early 1950s. He brings kind of an established, successful way of doing comedy uh, to, the, to the show. And actually his, his kind of style of song, monologues, wisecracks, jokes, routines and sketches influences the format of the programme then. But what makes Un Due Tre stand out is the target of the jokes that Tognazzi and Vianello often tell. They're regularly performing parodies of and funny stories about TV, its popular programmes and its stars. But actually this arguably makes sense if we think for a moment about the nature of the Italian audience in this period. Monteleone on the screen is pointing out that for varietà, quote, we must remember that for a genre based above all on parody, universally recognisable case studies, situations and characters were needed. Neither the political nor the social environment, and not even that of sport, could provide this material because of the restrictive climate of the time. Television, with its stars, successes and failures and innovations, therefore became the principal frame of reference for this type of programming. And in using television as material for its sketches and routines, Un Due Tre also underscores the wider growing importance of TV in everyday Italian life. Like we said, by the end of the 1950s, more, more people had access to TV, more Italians were watching, they'd been able to see other parts of Italy, they'd been able to learn about life across the peninsula and beyond actually. And Monteleone makes the point that by watching television, quote, the lower classes for the first time in the history of Italy were taken out of their traditions, context and experiences and pushed to become part of a wider collective audience. So television programmes like Un, Due, Tre may well have satirised television in this period, but they nevertheless contributed to an education about the medium and to a wider social and cultural integration for the audience. And you can see this in the clip that I want to play for you, which is from the first episode of the 59 series. Um, just to explain what's going on here. So Tognazzi and Vianello are performing a parody routine of the popular quiz show Lascia or Adopia. And in particular of two contestants, the Appiotti twins, who had appeared on the quiz and who had won 5 million lire in a final contest against another contestant, Il Maggiore Detti. You need all of that information to get what's going to come next, okay? Um, also, I apologise, the sound quality on this is poor, it's the nature of the digitisation, um, but hopefully the subtitles will at least give you a sense of what's going on. Vi farò una domanda in mitologia, in mitologia. 
E per questo abbiamo fatto venire due celebri sorelle, due espertissime in mitologia, che le presenteranno. Con esperienze loro allora? Sì, sì. Siamo un po' emozionati di ritornare qui su questo palito scenico, però siamo tanto contenti, siamo tanto contenti. Sì, siamo veramente contenti, siamo veramente contenti perché a noi ci hanno chiamato e invece il maggiore no. Maggiore? maggiore. Ah. Ah. Via, via, queste cose non le fa. Eh no, dai, quando ci vuole ci vuole, via. Il maggiore era antipatico, non mi è vero, non se ne approfittava perché lui era... Again, the, the kind of banter got a bit difficult to subtitle, so I thought I'll pause it there. But you get, you get the kind of general gist of what's going on there. Um, just to explain who they are par parodying, there are the twins actually on La Chena Doppia, that's, that's kind of how they appeared. And the name tags round the neck is indeed what one did on the show as a name tag, you had it hung round your neck. Um, so Tognazzi sums up the importance of this kind of comedy routine which targeted TV programmes and personalities that were familiar to the audience. The interview there is kind of reproduced in the middle for you, but he's, he kind of explains, quote, we were parodying not just the people and characters who appeared on screen during the week, but also the TV directors and television itself. In other words, we were inviting viewers to critically reflect on what they'd watched that week. So comedy and parody that highlighted television, its programme formats and its production methods functioned also to educate the audience and encourage them to critically engage with and learn from what they were watching. The self-referentiality of these parody sketches also highlights a wider trend in TV and varietà in particular in this period, as programmes sought to educate their audiences about what they were watching on TV, technological innovations behind what they were watching, and also then about their own reception of and response to programming. So let me move to kind of try and sum up some of the kind of broader thoughts I've been having about these, these programmes. Now, the fact that it's commonly the established stars of theatre, cinema and radio who refer to television and encourage this kind of critical engagement by audiences starts to lend authority to Italian television's educative mission in this period and to the medium itself. And the borrowing of stars, Alfonsetti has argued, actually reflects a wider borrowing from other already established media forms by Italian TV during the 50s. And in her analysis, which you've got, you've got on screen, Varietà exemplifies the early character of television as being like radio, from which television inherits and transforms the musical component, and as being like theatre, from which television claims the legacy of the review and the avant spettacolo, the curtain raiser, adopting them to television's rhythms and spaces. So this borrowing results in an inherent multimediality in Varietà, which we've seen and by extension also in early Italian TV. And this multimediality is identifiable in the use of content from other media forms, by which I mean we've got material that comes from radio, theatre and cinema, in terms of songs that then get performed on TV, plays and sketches that go from the theatre to the television screen, and films that get shown on TV after they've been released in, in, in cinemas. We've also then got borrowings of formats, from radio, theatre and cinema, by which I mean we've got types of programmes being borrowed and adapted to television, such as the song contest or the theatre drama, as well as the adaptation of the creative and productive practices that governed radio programming, review and curtain raiser theatre productions and film. And then finally, we've also got the borrowing of stars from radio and popular music more broadly, as well as theatre and cinema, who are clearly associated with and best known for their work in their, represent in their respective media, and thus who bring kind of established star meanings to their appearances on television. To conclude though, I want to suggest that this kind of multimediality and borrowing is actually at the heart of what is culturally specific to Italian television in this period and to Varietà in particular. 
In Varieta, we have the intersection and interaction of multiple media forms through the borrowing from and merging together of content formats and stars. But if we take this idea of inter from those notions of intersection and interaction, we can also begin to argue that Varieta and actually perhaps by extension Italian television are actually intermedial in this period. Now, such a reading acknowledges the importance of the individual media forms for television, so it acknowledges that multimedial aspect that I've pointed out, but it also allows for an exploration of what happens when the media forms intersect and interact on the small screen. Now, the creative potential of the in-between or the interstice is picked up by Chapel and Kattenbelt in their analysis of intermediality in theatre, and you've got their definition on the screen so you can read that. But they're arguing that intermediality in theatre and performance is a creative and mental space that operates in between. Okay, so it is that the, the kind of the intersections of media then create an intermedial space which encourages, quote, the exchangeability of expressive means and aesthetic conventions between different art and media forms and ultimately the production of new meanings and significances for the art and media forms in question. Now, I know they're writing about theatre, but I think actually we can apply their ideas to Varieta of the 1950s, certainly, where theatre and cinema and popular music and radio and actually opera and dance, but I haven't talked about those, all those forms intersect and interact to produce a creative in-between space that in fact characterises television in this period more broadly. So what I'm thinking I'm going to tentatively suggest in this project, and you can see my hesitancy here after eight weeks of thinking about this, but what I think I'm going to be suggesting here is then, um, as an intermedial medium that stages these interactions and intersections of other media forms, Varieta provides a space in which we see emerging new meanings for television as a media form. And these new meanings are about entertainment genres and practices communities of viewers and modes of reception, at least in the 1950s. These new meanings in turn function to create and subsequently educate the new national community of television viewers in this period. In the examples I've looked at, Italian TV through Varietà was showcasing and thus educating viewers about specifically national ways of behaving, national musical genres and tastes, national values and ideals as regards gender, and national models of reception for television. The stars of theatre, music and cinema who appear in the Varieta then come to represent the education that television was offering, but also bring authority from their association with already established media forms and thus lend credibility to television's new significances and its broader mission to create this viewing public, shape their consumption and reception practices and educate them in a range of government approved ideals and values. It's ultimately the intermediality of television in this period that enables the educative and homogenizing mission of the Rai, which then is embodied in the stars of music, theater, and cinema, who we've just seen. Thanks to their work on television though, they would then come to be known and loved as TV stars in their own right, both in this period and beyond. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, that was such a rich talk. I know you've achieved so much <laughs> in the last two months, and um, yeah, absolutely brilliant. And I thought the um, the clips were just so well chosen. I have a reading list. <laughs> I'm going to. Um, we can have time for Q and A. So thank you, Rachel, for agreeing to do that. Um, what we'll do is I will get up the. Um, Question. It's yeah. at this point that I'm very pleased you're doing this and not me because I don't know which button to press. Now, <laughs> no, so. don't worry. And um, we'll make that larger, potentially. Um, but I thought what we do is we can start from a question from the audience and then um, invite our online audience um, to type in their questions as well. Um, so, shall we start with the audience we have in the room? Um, if there's a question, Zoe has a microphone. Um, so, just wave to Zoe or Emlyn. Yes, and we can put on. Hi, um, sorry, Rachel, thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, I have a question about something 
something that you didn't mention in the talk that I was wondering about. Um, so in Britain, this is exactly um, a thing the same period as black and white history show. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering about race. Is there anybody who is not white in these shows, in the public or the guests or members of the orchestra? Do you know to with black face or a similar kind of racialized type of comedy performance? Or is this just an all white space? That's a great question. Thank you. I'll try and repeat it also in case it didn't come through for Zoom. Um, and also then you can correct me if I've not got the question right. So the question was about the, the presence of kind of a, yeah, a racial race on television, basically. Is this an all white space in Italy in the period? Or do we get kind of examples of blackface? Also, do we get black performers? Um, so what's going on? Um, it's a predominantly all white space. But what's interesting is that you do have some black performers, but they are guest stars. Um, so again, for the shows that I've spot, I've been watching, um, there's a really early one from 1956, for example, called Music Hall, which has a fantastic kind of transnational feel to it with guest stars from across across the world, actually. Um, and actually, the, yeah, I was really struck by Henri Salvador of all people, who I guess is you know is kind of an example of a, a non-Italian, non-white performer. Um, Undo e Tre also then have some guest performers from the kind of broader kind of world of popular music um, with a Brazilian singer, but she's a black Brazilian singer, um, whose name, having listened to it six times, I still didn't get. Um, but the interesting thing is that they are all guest performers. There's, 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 um, you know, there's, there's no kind of regular performer then who appears. Um, I haven't found any instances of blackface either. I don't know if that means that they weren't there or if they deliberately haven't been digitized and saved. So I, I, I can't, I, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, I'd need to do a little bit more kind of rummaging around in the archives for, for kind of any written material around what, what else was on these programs. But thus far, no, no examples as yet. So thank you for the question, that's really good. Thank you. And um, I'd encourage our online audience to type in a question if they have one. Um, we don't have one yet, so there's scope in the audience to ask another one. Um, yeah, we have uh, um, Evelyn, um, third row from the back. <laughs> <laughs> third row from the front, sorry. Yeah, I think I'll point out just to ask the question. Just thank you. First of all, I am an I'm just in admiration, I'm lost in admiration for the level, for the depth. I know you are a, uh, a doctor, so I, I wasn't expecting anything, but not anything different, but it, it's really beyond expectations. I just wanted to, to make a point for, for the lady who asked. There were no black Italians, except for immigrants who um, were completely out of the picture in society, so it was not like in Britain, there were no um, immigrants from colonies. And in fact, there was a racism, a problem with racism, but it was domestic. So the immigration was all domestic from the south to the north. That's, that was where the problem. So if you're asking, was there a racial problem? Racial in the sense of discrimination, it's on, it's on another level. Um, having said this, I, I just wanted to make, I'm, I'm really um, surprised by the understanding of, of the research. I just wanted to make a few points. One, um, Adriano Celentano, his um, revolutionary and worrying um, side was actually more on the dancing, I think, than in the in the in the, urlo, in the, in the, in the music itself. It was called the, the man on suspensions on, on he was like um, the um, spring coil uh, man. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I agree on the education side, but in reality, I think you uh, should really consider what the social um, context of Italy was at the time. There was no common language, unlike in Britain, where you have accents, but everyone would more or less understand. And the other um, 
they found was one literacy. So the whole of the half of the country had literacy levels that we do not expect in a modern country. So um, one of the reasons why uh, music was so popular was that it, it could be understood by everyone. Yeah. So I don't think it was so much, there, there was of course an ideological um, perspective, but there was also a, like a very basic um, communication skills. So it was the first time that Italians from different places could understand something, had something in common. And finally, the other, um, uh, the other point I wanted to make is that unlike in Britain, um, TV consumption in that specific time frame was a very social uh, event. The families did not own TV sets, and unlike in Britain, there was never a TV set rental. Please correct me if I'm uh, wrong. A lot of people in Britain actually did not own the TV set, they would rent it, and here instead, only the TV set was like owning a luxury car in that period of time. So people would invite uh, neighbors, and so it was a very big social event. And one last cue is to focus a lot on the concept of Saturday, because all of what you have described happened on the night of Saturday, except for the quiz show, which was just as popular, if not even more popular, than, than, than this. So this is just a, a small, it's not a question, but I just wanted to give a different perspective from someone who is Italian and has not lived the period Indirectly, yes, but uh, with a more domestic perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going I'll, to I'll, I'll, I'll possibly kind of just a couple of things that spring to mind from what you've said. Um, I think there might be something in the chat as well, Harriet, if you want to have a look. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, and again, I'll try and re <laughs> summarize for the, for the Zoom audience and then kind of respond. So, the first thing that you were saying about Tilentano and the kind of the kind of the threat of the dancing and the moves, yes, of Il Molleggiato, he's known as, isn't he? Um, absolutely, the dancing is part of that. Um, also, I think the clothes are part of that. I think um, the music, though, is certainly definitely a big part of that, too. When you look at kind of um, reviews in the press of the period of Urlo and some of the Urlo singers, there's a real concern about what these singers might do and how they might influence and lead astray. Um, Italian young people, the, the, the tension is particularly clear with the female Ulatrice, actually, Ulatrice, and I, I'm not going to talk about Mina because that's not what I'm doing tonight, but having written a book about her, the, the tension around her and her movement and her sexiness and the fact she wears trousers in this period and the fact that she looks directly at the camera when she's performing, all of those things were very troubling. So I think there's a there's a kind of a whole wave of moral parallel around these singers kind of in general for lots of reasons, but yes, down Dancing, definitely a big part of that. Um, you made a point then about kind of looking at not just the kind of educative function of television, but also the social context and that that kind of yeah the the, the place of language in the period, the literacy rates in the period, and yeah the, the kind of communication experience, kind of education. And yes, absolutely, I agree with you that that's something that I need to be thinking about and looking at a little bit more. Didn't have time today because I wanted basically I wanted to show you a lot of TV tonight. Um, but yes, I, I find it very interesting that, that certainly TV is part of that broader kind of move towards a common language, which is also then kind of achieved by cinema, by radio, by music as well, like, like you said, um, which for me suggests something really important and really fascinating is going on in the media and cultural industries in Italy in the 1950s, where there are some real important synergies going on as well. So that's one of the things that I'm going to kind of look at further in the project. Um, and then, yeah, you, you were talking about TV consumption as being a social and communal event. And yes, absolutely. People would go around to other people's houses. Having a TV was absolutely a, a kind of a, a luxury item. The other thing is that, that if, if your neighbours didn't have a TV, your local bar would often have a TV. So, you, you know, you would go to a local bar and in a way you'd get you get a mix of audiences at the, in the bar to watch TV. 
more so perhaps than the cinema in that families would go together to the bar to watch television but you wouldn't necessarily go as a family always to the cinema or girls and women would go to the bar in a way that they wouldn't necessarily go to the cinema again i need to think that through a little bit but but yes absolutely that kind of social aspect also of the reception i think needs to come into play as well when i talk about this creation of a community of viewers and yes initially the last comment was about focusing on saturday night Initially, the project was actually going to be called Saturday Night Variety TV. But when you, I, start look, I started looking at this period in particular, and um, not all of them actually went out initially on Saturday night, which I found really interesting. And when you start to look at when they go out and what days they go out, they don't seem to be filmed for a particular day. There seemed to be a lot of, kind of flexibility in the schedule, certainly in this early period. So that was why I took Saturday out. But yes, I'm definitely looking back at Saturdays into the 1960s. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and perhaps we can discuss it more over the drink. Yes. Um, we have a question from the online audience from Catherine Baker. Thank you. It's an observation and a question. So I'll read it slowly to you and you can see you it. So it says, whenever I hear you talking about your work, it makes me think of Yugoslavia. And this is no exception. It resonated a lot with the Yugoslav context where stars and presenters operated to create a shared sense of Yugoslav culture, brackets with the extra um, the level there of programmes being exchanged and relayed between the different Yugoslav Republic TV st studios. Mm -hmm. I know San Remo was a major influence on Yugoslav pop festivals, of course, too, but is there any evidence of practical and technical cooperation between Italian and Yugoslav TV on variety programming or related things? Thank you very much, Catherine. Catherine, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to have a look, actually, at some of the credits. Um, I, it doesn't, from what I've seen, nothing strikes me immediately as, as, as there being a kind of a clear kind of um, cooperation. The, the credits were really interesting actually for the programmes in a whole host of ways, because obviously you get the same names coming up time and time again, but they were all by and large Italian names. I can't think of any that weren't. The thing that did strike me, which I do want to look at a little bit more in depth, um, where there were six female producer and director names that came up in the initial kind of choosing of the programmes and they're working then kind of into the 50s, 60s and, and through. Um, and my little side project, which I have not had a chance to touch yet in the last eight weeks, but I really want to touch, is to actually look more at the work of these, these kind of female directors in what is clearly a, a male dominated environment. Um, but yeah, Catherine, I'll add Yugoslav cooperation to that list of things to do. So thank you for the question. Very good, thank you. Um, and turning back to our audience in the room, um, Eleanor, I can see you waving, and then we have John in the back row too. So thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I just got a question about, um, I don't know if there's any evidence of extent to which politicians intervened in the commissioning or censoring. <laughs> I had a I had a sixth example for this evening, which was a wonderful one on censorship. So, um, so the question was in terms of the evidence um, for the extent to which politicians actually actively intervened in in kind of programming decisions, I guess, in terms of content, but then also actively censoring. So there is definitely evidence out there. I haven't managed to go and collect a lot of it yet. Um, the interesting thing is that the directors, the kind of directors of content, the programming directors of RAI are basically government officials in this period. They are chosen by the government. So they're not politicians, but they know who's paying their wages, if you know what I mean. Um, so in a sense, the kind of censorship is actually kind of already inbuilt in that there's there's a list of things that you can and cannot mention in TV in this period. You know, divorce you can't talk about, abortion you can't talk about, obviously, extramarital affairs you can't talk about, but you know, you, you also can't show kind of nude legs. You know, if any dancers are, are, are dancing in these shows, they have to have dark dance tights on. So there's a whole list of things that you can and cannot do in this period. Um, but a really kind of clear example of intervention is actually on that last series that I showed, Un, Due, Tre. Um, so um, a sketch that was improvised, probably shouldn't have been improvised with, but I mean, 
to be fair, it was fine in the sense that um, it's a sketch about the president of the Republic who on the day before had been hosting Charles de Gaulle as a visit. They'd gone to La Scala to watch, um, I don't even know what opera, but they'd gone for a performance. They stood up for the national anthems, gone to sit down. De Gaulle finds his seat and the Italian president misses and ends up on the floor and they have to quickly, you know, the camera's cut away, you know. And the following kind of night then on Un, Due, Tres, it gets filmed. Tognati and Vianello stand up to do their welcome instead of sitting down, they usually sit down. So they stand up to do it and they go to sit down and Vianello sits down and Tognati falls over. And Vianello goes, well, who do you think you are? And Tognati goes, well, anybody can fall over. The following day, they are both summarily fired from Barai. So they're kind of, there are, you know, certain levels of jokes that you cannot tell. Um, as you can probably imagine, that clip doesn't exist in the archives either. So, so yeah, definite examples of direct intervention and censorship, yes. Um, there are no questions online, so we can go to John. Um, my question is actually very similar, but thank you, Rachel, for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, and you, you, you talked about um, government ideals and, and, and so on, so this is going to be perhaps slightly different from the previous one. Um, were those ever determined in any formal way, and how were they communicated? And as another question, it could be different, but really, was one of these programs live? And if so, was there ever any attempt to subvert those ideals? I mean, in America, for example, the Ed Sullivan Show, which is somewhat similar in, in format, um, there were attempts at the Rolling Stones to be more serious. Okay, so the, the two part question then. The first part then, in terms of the, these kind of I mentioned this kind of idea of kind of government government approved ideals and values that, that were kind of being transmitted. Were these specifically determined in a formalized way? How were these communicated? Is that more or less the first question? And then the second question was about were these shows live? And as a result, was it possible to actually subvert any of these ideals? Okay. Um, I need to do a little bit more work on kind of the government papers and communications around television in the period and the kind of policies my sense is that there is well, not my sense there is a big long list of the things that you can and cannot talk about so in a way the ideals and values aren't necessarily written down but they're clearly informing that list so they are determined they are formalized they are published you know in the right and they are then available to producers and things so so there is something definitely formalized there but it's not obviously the ideals and the values it's the result of the ideals and values in terms of what you can and cannot say um i need to find the list it is out there i just need to go and get a book <laughs> um the the question about were these live i don't think they were they're recorded live in front of an audience, but then they're broadcast after the fact. Um, again, I'll double check on that. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the ideals don't get subverted, interestingly. Um, and now I am going to go back to Mina. I'm sorry, but you know, because um, she's a really good example of a popular music star who becomes a television host of these kinds of shows. Um, and 1961, so it's just about there for what we were talking about tonight. Um, but she is the face of then um, a really popular Saturday night show, then Studio Uno. Um, and she appears very much in the guise of the kind of demure, respectable, young woman kind of starlet soubrette, um, always dressed very modestly um, and very much then in kind of opposition to two guest stars called the Kessler twins who are the kind of song and dance routine providers on the show um, and they're always wearing kind of leotards you know that you can see their whole body Mina then she's always filmed kind of in a very demure way you know always very respectable but she herself actually subverts that image a little bit because as she direct addresses the audience she sort of winks at the camera or she'll, she'll, you know, she'll sort of talk to you over here 
and then she'll kind of, you know, there'll be a side comment over it. So she herself almost plays with this representation of herself as this kind of demure, respectable woman. Um, and it really goes out again, she gets away with it because it's not obvious subversion, it's kind of a very subtle kind of way of suggesting that actually, yeah. She may be respectable on the surface, but we know her past. She's this Urla star. We know she was dangerous. She may well have transitioned to being this kind of respectable, modern canzone all'italiana singer, but she's not forgotten everything in a way. So there's kind of a subversion of a gender ideal there that does go on a little bit. So you do get instances, and I'm on the lookout for more of those as I go through. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for your um, question, John. Um, there are no more questions online. Um, are there any more questions in the audience? Or shall we, um, I think we should uh, go upstairs uh, for a drink. Um, but before we do that, um, online audience, I'm sure I can hear you clapping, but um, real audience, um, let's give a round of applause to brilliant people. Thank you.